soon as we go live, then I will do your introduction and I'll throw it over to you afterward. This is very interesting. And, and we are live, it looks like. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Sarah Gott Wallace, and I am one of the co-chairs of the Dr. Talbot Spivak Holocaust Memorial Committee. Tonight, it is my honor and privilege to introduce my mentor and dear friend, Dr. Paul Bartrop. Dr. Bartrop is a multi-award winning scholar of Holocaust and genocide. He is a professor emeritus of history and former director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Research at Florida Gulf Coast University, right here in Fort Myers, Florida. He is the author or editor of 25 books. Well, only 25, right? <laughs> some of the most recent, we're only gonna go through some of the recent ones here. They include the Routledge History of the Second World War, Children of the Holocaust, Heroines of Vichy France, Rescuing the French Jews During the Holocaust, um, Perpetrating the Holocaust, Leaders, Enablers, and Collaborators, The Holocaust, a Resource and Document Collection, which has four volumes. And for that research and document collection, it won the Society for Military History Distinguished Book Award for 2018. Dr. Bartrop is a past president of the Australian Association for Jewish Studies, as well as a previous vice president of the Midwestern Jewish Studies Association here in the United States. So obviously a gentleman who needs no introduction. Tonight, we are going to be hearing from him as he talks about British diplomatic heroes and the rescue of Jews in Germany during Kristallnacht. Without further ado, I present to you our esteemed speaker, keynote speaker, Dr. Paul Bartrop, all the way from Australia. Thank you, sir. Off to you. Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, I should say good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, good morning to those of you who are here in Australia. Um, <clears throat> should there be any? Um, amongst the things that were just mentioned by Sarah, I'm delighted to report that that history of the Rowley history of the Second World War um, was released yesterday. Um, and I'm, I'm quite delighted to be able to announce that. Let's talk briefly about um, Kristallnacht by way of a start. Um, known as the, uh, known colloquially as the Night of Broken Glass, uh, the event um, known as Kristallnacht um, on the night, across the night of November 9, 10, 1938, and in the days that followed, uh, persecution intensified. Um, this was a sudden and very widespread uh, Nazi assault on uh, Jews and their property throughout Germany. Uh, it saw large scale arrests of Jews as what were called reprisals uh, for the assassination of German consular official Ernst von Rath uh, by a Jewish student, um, Herschel Grinspan, in Paris a few days earlier. Um, the pogrom, we'll call it a pogrom, the, ter the term Kristallnacht, by the way, was a, a term, um, a satirical term given by the, um, uh, the Nazis themselves to, uh, to what had happened. They thought it was a, it's very, very ginchy, very pretty to be able to speak in terms of um, the um, um, broken, broken glass um, that was um, shining in the moonlight. It was the first widespread use of massive force against Germany's Jews, resulted, resulted in greater concentrated destruction than any previous anti-Jewish measure from the Hitler regime. Uh, the illustration here just of, of, of one of the synagogues that had been uh, destroyed and then burned out. Now, as we're going to be talking today about British diplomats, I should say, uh, British diplomats stationed in Germany um, had engaged in rescue efforts before this explosion of anti-Semitic violence. These diplomats, these, these men, they're always men at that time, um, were, had been charged, diplomats generally were charged with uh, the twin tasks Twin tasks, in the words of the British ambassador to Berlin, Sir Neville Henderson, we're going to be hearing more about him later, uh, who wrote that um, the task of a diplomat is to interpret faithfully the views of the British government 
to the government of Germany. And the second part of that twin task was to explain the views of Nazi Germany back to, back to London. Again, uh, that it would be done faithfully. In this context, the diplomats were the eyes and ears of the foreign office in Germany for the foreign office. The British foreign office, they were um, the eyes and ears of what was happening in Germany. As it were, uh, they were, as one author has written, they were the frontline diplomats, frontline diplomats in and what was becoming an increasingly dangerous situation. And as I said, from an early time, efforts were made to help Jews suffering from persecution at the hands of the Nazis. Historian uh, Sir Martin Gilbert, the late uh, Sir Martin Gilbert, has identified, for example, that the British Consul General uh, stationed in Munich, a um, man called John Carvel, we'll hear about him a bit later on, um, issued certificates uh, for the British mandate in Palestine as early as 1937. He did this on, on his own initiative. And this, this, le this led to the release of some 300 Jewish men in Dachau um, because they now had a, a permit uh, to leave. The, um, the, the position of the Chargé de Four, the Chargé d'Affaires, the uh, deputy to the ambassador, uh, were, was uh, occupied by uh, Sir George Ogilvy Forbes. You can see him there on the screen. Sir George Ogilvy Forbes, which we're certainly seeing more about him, uh, he also um, expedited the emigration of Jews from Germany. Um, again, on his own initiative, utilizing the uh, authority of his um, uh, role. Again, another one. Immediately after the Anschluss, the Union uniting Austria and Germany um, in March of 1938, Britain's passport control officer in Munich, Captain Thomas Kendrick, organized his staff in issuing passports uh, and visas and so forth, uh, to operate in 12-hour shifts, handing out visas to more than 200 Austrian Jews per day. This intensified during the summer such that, of 1938, such that uh, by the time he was, he was ultimately expelled, um, seen that he was considered a spy, and actually, he actually was a spy, um, but utilizing his position as passport control officer, um, by the time he was expelled in 1938, uh, in August of 1938, uh, many thousands of Jews had received entry permits for Palestine. Uh, and Kendrick has been um, written up uh, in a book called Spymaster. Spymaster is a new book by British author Helen Fry. Um, she described him as Britain's Oscar Schindler. That's no mean um, um, celebration, is it? Um, and it'll be interesting to see what sort of reception her book uh, receives once it enters the mainstream just next month. Something to look out for. Spymaster, Helen Fry, F-R-Y. I want to talk a bit here about Sir George Ogilvy Forbes, who I mentioned. Um, British historian A.J. Sherman uh, once wrote that reactions in Britain to the events of Kristallnacht and after, he said, and after, were swift. Reactions were swift and virtually unanimous in condemnation of the persecution. Britain's ambassador to Berlin, Sir Neville Henderson, uh, had, or had left um, on sick leave, or con not, not con or sick leave, uh, had left Berlin for London a few weeks before. He'd, he'd managed to last his way through the um, the crisis uh, um, over Czechoslovakia um, that um, uh, resolved, not resolved very well, but resolved at Munich um, at the end of September, and then left uh, Berlin uh, to go back to London uh, to, be, to be treated for the, the cancer, which was ultimately to take his life um, in 1942. Accordingly, the first official comment that uh, arrived at the, at the British Foreign Office in London during the morning of, of Thursday, November 10th, 1938, was sent by Henderson's deputy, um, Sir George Ogilvy Forbes, who I mentioned a little while ago. 
There's another picture of him. Now, Ogilvy Forbes' views regarding Hitler and the Nazis were significantly different to those of Henderson. And he drew, drew attention to the fact that Hitler's obsession with the Jews indicated his very dangerous frame of mind, Hitler's very frame, dangerous frame of mind. So who was this guy? Um, born in Scotland originally. Um, he, it was said that during times of, uh, of stress, he would um, relieve his tension by playing the bagpipes, um, which must have been a bit of a shock to uh, the various stations where he was uh, sent. He'd previously been chargé d'affaires, as I said, that, that office is uh, assistant to the ambassador, uh, in Madrid and Valencia during the Spanish Civil War, um, prior to taking up his post in Berlin in April 1937. The interesting thing about that is that um, um, it's not common, or it wasn't at the time common, for an assistant uh, to the ambassador and for the ambassador to both be um, placed in station so close to each other. Um, uh, Ogilvy Forbes was sent in, uh, in April 1937 to Berlin. Henderson was a very short time thereafter, also in 1937. Earlier, while he was in Spain, um, Ogilvy Forbes had been re was, was renowned for um, his honesty seen to be for his honesty, for his impartiality. Um, and again, in Spain, uh, during, this, uh, he, uh, during his time there, he used his position to save numerous lives through the, through, through the embassy. In Berlin, uh, his relationship with Henderson was strained from the outset. Um, at one point, uh, Ogilvy Forbes wrote to um, Oliver Harvey, who was the principal private secretary to the foreign secretary, Secretary of State would say in America, uh, he found Henderson to be uh, rude and domineering was the term that was used. And it took him little time to conclude that Henderson's views about Hitler's peaceable intentions, so-called, coupled with what he saw as moderation, wait for it, he thought uh, Henderson was, he considered um, um, Hitler to be moderate regarding Germany's Jews. Um, well, Ogilvy Forbes said that such attitudes were both morally wrong and had the potential to lead to calamity. It was quite diametrically opposite. We'll talk more about that. Diametrically opposite to, um, to the ambassador. But he was in charge. Um, Henderson was away and he was in charge at the time of Kristallnacht in the Berlin embassy. So on, on November 10th, look at the calendar. On November 10th, 1938, while the Kristallnacht pogrom was in progress, while it was raging, Ogilvy Forbes sent a, looked out the window, sent a telegram to the Foreign Office. Um, he had just returned from touring around Berlin's major shopping street, uh, Friedrichstrasse. Um, just running street, running parallel to where the British Embassy was. Um, he noted, now, I've got a few quotes here along the way. He noted that uh, Jewish shops are being smashed and looted by youths in plain clothes, followed by large and smiling crowds, including soldiers and others in Nazi party uniforms. The police, he wrote, are taking no notice. You can't get anything that's more um, on mark right now in real time than a message of that kind. By that stage, he concluded, seven synagogues in Berlin had already been burned or were still burning. And he added that, and I'll quote this direct, he added, the facts that these attacks began only after midnight last night and that Jewish shops and offices have been systematically singled out indicate that this action was deliberately planned. It's quite an indictment. In a further memorandum on the same day, there was, there, 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 there was a lot of correspondence that day. Um, he wrote to uh, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax, and he reported, reinforced, anti-Jewish rioting on an unprecedented scale, he put, had broken out in Berlin that night before, 
and he added that similar reports were now coming in from all over the provinces. He's actually speaking there about the messages that are coming in from his consuls in, in various German cities. Later that morning, in another message, he indicated that there were allegations in Germany that there was British collusion, that there had been British collusion in the assassin, in the murder of, of von Rath, which precipitated this. Well, that was propaganda um, from the part of the, uh, the German government. His initial view was that, uh, in spite of all of that, was that um, the British government should exercise some caution. Um, he saw that there was, a, he used the term, that there was a wasp's nest that had been stirred up. He said, in view of the wasp's nest that had been stirred up, we would be ill-advised in our own interests and that of the Jews themselves to poke our fingers into the mess. By November 13th, that had changed dramatically. Ogilvy Forbes wrote that uh, many Jews in Berlin were now, and here's his term, quote, wandering about in the streets and parks, afraid to return to their homes. Following the introduction of measures that were intended to deprive all Jews of their means of earning a livelihood. Ogilvy Forbes at this point could not contain his outrage. In language that was not particularly diplomatic, let's say, he wrote, I can find no words strong enough in condemnation of the disgusting treatment of so many innocent people and the civilized world is faced with the appalling sight of 500,000 people about to rot away in starvation, unquote. And the next day came the first indication after Kristallnacht that it might not have been an isolated event. Ogilvy Forbes noted that there was grave apprehension, was his term, grave apprehension among Jews that there will be further excesses once von Rath had been returned from Paris, his body from had been returned from Paris for a very, very big state funeral. And this idea of a second Kristallnacht, the prospect of a second Kristallnacht, um, was something that bubbled along for a while and would also be revisited later. Reflecting on the entire situation in a long letter to Halifax, to Lord Halifax on November 16th, Ogilvy Forbes concluded that, quote, there can be no doubt that the deplorable excesses perpetrated on the 10th of November were instigated and organized by the German government. So we got the, this reinforcement of his, of his initial thoughts um, upon reflection. Those attacks continued. Um, those attacking the Jews commenced operations at a given hour and singled out with uncanny precision Jewish shops, buildings, and places of business. And it seems that not many mistakes were made along the way, he added. In other words, that this was so orchestrated that the perpetrators knew exactly where to go to. And he concluded and he continued that the, um, the present position of the Jews is indeed tragic. It was a situation in which they dwell in the grip and at the mercy of a brutal oligarchy which fiercely resents all humanitarian foreign intervention. No amount of condemnation would have any influence over the insensate gang in present control of Nazi Germany. Quite simply, he wrote, the Nazis had left loose forces of medieval barbarism against the Jews of Germany who presented not a national, but a world problem, which if neglected contains the seeds of a terrible vengeance in the future. You can see, Sir George Ogilvy Forbes was furious at what had happened. He was disgusted by what he was seeing. And as he was now Johnny on the spot, so to speak, he was, he was the, um, Temporary ambassador, he was away. So these are the sorts of messages he was sending back to a government which, if you know anything about uh, British policy in the late 1930s, was um, committed to appeasing Germany and not saying things of this kind and not stirring up, uh, as he called it, the wasp's nest. But Ogilvy Forbes was not alone. 
while he was the senior British diplomat in Germany, others were also expressing their own disgust. Indeed, there were several who took um, positive measures to help Jews. And notable among these was a man with the wonderful name of Robert Smallbones, nicknamed amongst <laughs> others in, in the, uh, the Foreign Service as, as simply as Bones, which I think is interesting if you watch TV program, Bones. Um, Robert Smallbones was the British Consul General in Frankfurt, Frankfurt and Maine. Britain had uh, consular staff all over, cities everywhere, and he was the consul general in Frankfurt. He was a, a, a professional diplomat who had served in several postings um, in Africa and in Europe and in uh, Latin America prior to being appointed to Germany in 1932. One of his um, earlier postings um, was as vice consul in what was then called Portuguese West Africa, which is uh, Portuguese West Africa at the time, modern day uh, country of Angola. I add this because I want to give a bit of an indication as to who, who, who this, this guy was. Um, he was active there in work to bring an end to slavery within Angola. Um, as, as we know today as Angola. He also stood out from the norm in that he married, you can see him there with his wife, he, he, he married a, a, a person who wasn't British. Um, again, not particularly uh, high on the uh, British um, 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 scale of things if you wanted to go anywhere and you married a foreigner. His wife, uh, was from uh, Norway originally. Now, when the pogrom took place, uh, as it turns out, Smallbones was in uh, London. He wasn't actually in Frankfurt at the time. Um, but being that he was in London, when he heard about what was happening uh, in Germany and in specifically uh, in Frankfurt, looking at his, uh, his town, um, without hesitation, he sought out leading members of the Home Office. I suppose these days we call it um, 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 homeland something, um, not, not homeland security, but the 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 the, um, uh, the department dealing with um, migration and, and with um, various things of that kind. Um, and he, he contacted people that he knew there at the Home Office to see what could be done to help Germany's Jews. He was told by one senior official that. Nothing could be done. And again, this fits into the German, uh, sorry, piggy button, the, the British notion of what was happening to the Jews in Germany as being an internal matter over which we have no control and, uh, and, and, and um, we don't have a dog in that fight. Senior official at the um, Home Office said, um, what can we do? We can't let them, that is to say the Jews, we can't let them come in and cause unemployment amongst our own people. Um, so there's nothing we can do. Smallbones was not deterred. Uh, he pressed this particular official who said, oh, well, I'm willing to listen. He said, um, if you've got a practical idea, let me know what can be done and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Smallbones suggested that if anyone was to be saved, Men who were imprisoned in concentration camps after the pogrom first had to be released. He knew that that was very much of a situation. Evidence that a British visa had been authorized could secure a man's release. He said, let's start with that. He also knew that British regulations did not allow for Jewish women and children to leave Germany without the male breadwinner of the family present. So if a husband or father is in the concentration camp, the wives and children couldn't leave without him. So Smallbone said, well, we're gonna get these men out of the concentration camps. 30,000 have been arrested over the last few days. We've got to and, and put in a concentration camp, put into Dachau and places like that. We've got to get them out of there to be able to allow families 
some sort of sucker to be able to come to Britain, perhaps. He, he then said, okay, that's my idea. And an arrangement was made for him to contact the Home Secretary, Sir Samuel Hoare. In interviewing Sir Samuel Hoare, he presented a plan for a limited two-year transit visa for German Jews to come to Britain while awaiting in an entry visa from a third country. They could leave Germany, they could get out of the camps, could leave Germany, they could come to, uh, to Britain for two years and utilizing that period of time to find somewhere more permanently. The only condition was that um, the, they would be unable to work while in the United Kingdom. That was taking care of that unemployment situation within Britain. Um, they'd have to find some form of sustenance that wouldn't take a job away from a British person. Straight away, Sir Samuel Hoare, the Home Secretary, accepted the proposal. He said, I don't need to refer this to Parliament. You have my authority. And an operation began and developed. Um, and as a result of what became known as the small bones system, by October 1939, so, so in other words, with, within less, this, less than a year, some 48,000 Jews from Germany had arrived in Britain. Their lives at least were saved for the time being. They were out of Germany. And throughout this time, Smallbones also visited concentration camps, demanding the release of Jews for whom visas had been granted. The um, the Jewish press in uh, within within Britain, I think, it was the Jewish uh, the Jewish Standard, what we call the Jewish Standard, I think, uh, gave him the title "the man who faced down the Gestapo." It was a term that he, he carried with him um, with great pride for the rest of his life. Um, Smallbones received um, enormous help within in Frankfurt uh, from his vice consul, a man called Arthur Dowden. Dowden worked to ensure that the British visas were in fact delivered. It was one thing to have things coming into the consulate, they then had to be distributed. And Arthur Dowden physically went out to places to deliver the visas to threatened Jewish families. In addition, given that Jews were not permitted to buy food for nine days after the pogrom, this is a localized thing within Frankfurt, Dowden provided practical help. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Vice Consul Dowden uh, was remembered by people afterwards that he drove through Frankfurt, drove through the town, drove through the city, distributing food from his car to those in want. Went from place to place. With small bones away in London, Dowden took it upon himself to open the consulate where hundreds of Jews sheltered during the pogrom night until the threat of arrest by the Gestapo diminished. Deep breath, okay. British diplomats in other locations were just as active. In Berlin, the British military attache a man with a hyphenated last name, his first name, Noel, uh, Mason McFarland, who's known to everybody in the service as Mason Mac. Um, so Noel Ma Mason, Mc uh, Colonel, uh, um, Mason McFarland, uh, helped carry, physically carry Jewish women into the embassy after they'd become physically distressed from hours of waiting in the, in the cold November streets. People were collapsing. Um, and so he, he and, and, and some of the others around him physically lifted up some of these ladies and took them inside. I mentioned earlier at the outset, I mentioned John Carvel, the Consul General in, in Munich. Um, he continued issuing certificates to Palestine as he had done before. Um, and again, with the item in hand, they could then uh, be permitted to uh, be released from the concentration camp. His vice consul, Carvel was the consul general in Munich, his vice consul, 
man called Frank Fulham, was particularly concerned to save children, went out of his way to identify children. Um, another diplomat, Donald Sinclair uh, Gaynor, who had formerly been in Munich, um, was sent to uh, Vienna after um, Austria had been uh, absorbed into Germany as Consul General. He reported to the Foreign Office his horror at seeing the destruction of synagogues in Salzburg and Linz, as well as in other, cases, in other locations in Vienna, and kept up the pressure uh, to uh, try to maintain things uh, in a positive sense to help people. Frank Foley was the passport control officer in Berlin. He also assisted, assisted Jews. He exploited loopholes in British immigration regulations and found imaginative ways to issue visas. I'll give you one case. Entry to Palestine required a guarantee of 1,000 pounds as, as landing capital, that you would uh, arrive, you would be able to show that you were in possession of a thousand pounds so that you would not become a charge upon public funds when you arrived. In this bond case, um, upon um, questioning, it was found that a person uh, only had 10 pounds in their possession. Foley said, okay, doesn't matter. I'll issue the permit for you. Um, upon your promise that the balance of 990 pounds would be available once you had landed in Haifa, the port um, in, in Palestine. And then he issued the visa on a promise. On another occasion, he accepted a guarantee in writing that the sum would be available once the applicant had crossed the border safely into the Netherlands. And in myriad ways such as this, Foley, together with his assistant, Margaret Reed, issued Jews, it was recorded later, with up to 10,000 visas um, during his, uh, this, this, this time in the period leading up from the November 1938 through until the end of the war, uh, until the outbreak of war, to the end, end, end of peace. Meanwhile, in London, concerns were expressed from an early date that what had happened in November 1938 might be repeated, that the Germans would see the panic that had spread so rapidly throughout the Jewish community, that people were desperate to try and find, find ways to get out, um, and that this might be repeated to hasten the Jewish um, exodus uh, from Germany. And fears of continuing persecution were real. On December 9th, the head of the Intergovernmental Committee on Refugees, Lord Winterton, you can see him there. For though any of you who know um, uh, about uh, this period of time, Lord Winterton had been the British representative uh, earlier in 1938 at the Evian Conference on Refugees. <clears throat> he is now leading up the Intergovernmental, on Refu Intergo Intergovernmental Committee on Refugees. And he wrote a confidential and very personal letter to Foreign Secretary um, um, Halifax. And in this, he stated that there, he said, there is every indication that the Germans are about to make an even more drastic and brutal attack on the Jews. This is often not borne in mind that, that, that um, Kristallnacht might not have only been a one-off. At the time, there were a number of people who said, look, this, this could seriously be the start of something within Germany to push out Jews as many as possible, as quickly as possible. Halifax, I beg your pardon, Winterton continued in his letter uh, to Lord Halifax. And he said the time might be approaching when it would be necessary to make a formal protest to the German government against the treatment of its Jews. I said before about the period of uh, appeasement within, within Britain, the very idea of doing this from Lord Winterton, who was actually a member of the, um, the British government at the time. This was quite, um, quite off center as far as anybody in the British government was concerned to even make, make a protest 
to the uh, German government, winked and said, no, it's about time, about time we started doing something and saying something. Although fears of a repetition were real, um, Britain's criticisms to be leveled against um, Germany's domestic programs. Okay, well now I started by talking about briefly about Sir Neville Henderson, the ambassador. Throughout all of this time, he'd been in Germany, or he'd been in Britain. I said he was uh, being treated for, um, for his, um, his cancer. Um, he returned, he returned back, he came back to the embassy um, on February 13th, 1939. So there's quite a period of time from November, um, the, the pogrom in November 19, through until February 13th, it was all Ogilvy Forbes who was running the show at that point. So Neville Henderson returned, take up the embassy, take up his ambassadorship um, on February 13th, 1939. A few words about Henderson. He was an appeaser. He was, he was very much, he was appointed to Berlin in 1937 because of his views on appeasing Hitler. They coincided directly with the government's views. He favoured acceptance of what he considered to be what he considered to be um, Hitler's legitimate demands internationally. While he was in Britain being treated for uh, for his cancer, uh, he did make a statement there about what was happening uh, over in Germany. Uh, his only response to, Christ, to uh, the, the Kristallnacht was that uh, if we talk about a non sequitur, something that just doesn't follow. Uh, he said this provided an opportunity to offer Hitler a comprehensive uh, settlement regarding the return of Germany's uh, overseas colonies that were taken from them at the end of World War I. Um, to to totally, off, totally off the mark in terms of a response, but that was the only thing he said. They're doing this, so we might have an opportunity to, to offer, them, offer them that about African colonies. Um, Henderson's biographer, who somewhat of a defender of, of Henderson, and um, his biography is a man called um, Peter Neville, and he's written, very sort of uh, tongue in cheek, uh, Henderson may not, this is a quote, Henderson may not have fully realized how appalling the events of the Kristallnacht actually were. When I read that, my immediate thought was, you think? Um, there's little doubt, in addition to all of that, that Henderson held unfavorable Jews, um, where Jews were concerned. Historian Bruce Strang um, has identified that Henderson considered Jews and communists, so always we've got that possibility of that connection there. Uh, Henderson considered Jews and communists to be warmongers and that Jews were in the forefront of stirring up anti-German feelings in Britain. I think to myself, I don't know that they actually needed very much help. Um, discussing Kristallnacht with Germany's ambassador in London, Herbert von Dirksen, Henderson suggested that angry British public opinion would be softened if Germany's persecution of the Jews was regularized placed into some sort of orderly and systematic manner. He didn't say it's wrong. He just said, regularize it, make it more steady, make it more predictable, this persecution of the Jews. Now, assessing Henderson's position regarding Jews, historians have conflicting perspectives. Um, an American, named Abraham Asher, described Henderson as having clear anti-Semitic prejudices. I would agree with that. Peter Neville, his biographer, Peter Neville, on the other hand, argues that his anti-Semitism was mild. An amazing way to describe his anti-Semitism was mild and didn't prevent him from being a friend of the Rothschild family. That's, that's how he put it. He said, uh, this 
hardly suggests that he was a convinced anti-Semite. The whole some of my best friends type notion. And I, I was thinking about this and recalled an old joke, not a very funny one, an old joke about how you define a British upper class anti-Semite. Um, well, the old joke said, this is a person who dislikes Jews more than is absolutely necessary. That's one that was bubbling along for many, many years. But writing about the whole issue after the war broke out in September 1939, Henderson wrote um, his account of the outbreak of the war after the fact. He gave his own insight into how he understood the, Christ, uh, the, the Kristallnacht pogrom. Um, he recognized, again, I say this after the war had broken out, he recognized that one of the motives for what he termed this disgusting exhibition was the opportunity to, as he says, he wrote, to plunder the Jews and expedite their expulsion. Well, nobody, nobody would have disagreed with that to plunder the Jews, yes, and to expedite their uh, expulsion. Most would have agreed with that. But conversely, this is, this is the kicker. He also wrote that the German government's action was, I hope you're sitting down, the German government's action was understandable. How does he just how, how did he justify that? Well, he said that the Nazi government, the 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 um, not just Hitler but all those around him, feared the prospect that another German Jew, inspired by the success of Herschel Greenspan, when he murdered um, Ernst von Rat, might follow his example and murder or try to murder Hitler, and that therefore this this justified or made it understandable why the Germans were concerned, why the Nazi government was concerned. This remarkable suggestion is without precedent among explanations for the November pogrom. It says much about Henderson's bias in rationalizing the whole thing after the fact. Okay, there's a picture of the embassy as it was then. Uh, in the British embassy. Henderson's management of the embassy staff upon his return to Berlin provides us with a clue as to how differently the British diplomatic response to the November pogrom might have been if he had been in Berlin at the time. When Henderson returned, his first significant act was to call all the senior embassy staff together. Not to say, thank you for holding the line while I was away, but rather to reprimand them for the negative tone of their reports while he was away. He accused them of comprehending the situation wrongly and misinforming the British government about the persecution of the Jews misinforming the British government about the persecution of the Jews. He instructed them in very clear terms that from now on, all reports from the embassy would have to conform strictly with his own personal opinions and that any diplomat, any member of staff who disobeyed this directive would be fired from the foreign office. On February 15th, 1939, two days after his return to Berlin, he sent a letter to the Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax, at the Foreign Office, emphasizing that in his view, quote, Hitler personally had disapproved of the campaign against the Jews. With this um, startling statement, appeasement was restored to British official reports coming from Berlin. And of course, that, that position would remain through to the outbreak of war in September 1939. Then, in a long message to Lord Halifax, 
on March 6, 1939, he denounced almost everything that Sir George Ogilvy Forbes had written during his absence. From then until the end of August, Henderson effectively cut Ogilvy Forbes out of any decision-making processes within the embassy. And of course, this, as you can anticipate, was a crucial, crucial act as relations between Britain and Germany sped unavoidably towards Hitler's war in September 1939. Now, we cannot know what the British diplomatic response to the November pogrom would have been if Sir Neville Henderson had been present in November 1938. Uh, it didn't work out that way. It didn't, didn't, didn't work out that way. But we do know that Sir George Ogilvy Forbes, together with his consuls and other officials outside of Berlin, met and confronted the challenge in a compassionate manner that literally, as we've seen, saved tens of thousands of Jewish lives. Ogilvy Forbes possessed a genuine sense of personal empathy with the sufferings of the Jews of Germany. He was just a decent guy. In compiling the Berlin Embassy's annual report for 1938, which is something he had to do because Henderson was away. He warned that unless Hitler was stopped by war, very clear about that, unless Hitler was stopped by war, he wrote, and I'll quote here, he said, extermination of the Jews of Germany can only be a matter of time. Again, quite unprecedented within the British diplomatic mindset of the time. I'll say it again. Unless Hitler was stopped by war, extermination of the Jews in Germany can only be a matter of time. This was, of course, starkly opposite to Henderson's views, for whom such considerations would have been beyond his comprehension. It can only be wondered, in addition to all of that, it can only be wondered as to uh, what the response might have been should the anticipated second Kristallnacht um, had, have, had have been eventuated, have eventuated in early 1939. On the balance of probabilities though, knowing what we know, both of Sir Neville Henderson, and of the constraints he placed over any further humanitarian actions from his junior officers, that whatever response would have come, if there had been a second Kristallnacht, I'm using that term in quotation marks, if there'd been a second Kristallnacht, we can anticipate that whatever response might have been, it would not have likely worked out to the advantage of Germans, Germany's Jews um, at a time when they needed all the help they could get. The plaque that you can see in front of you on the screen there uh, was, as you see, erected by the Association of Jewish Refugees. That's, that's an, uh, an, an association in Britain. And that plaque uh, has been affixed to the um, wall of the Foreign Office um, in Britain, where it, uh, where it is today. I'm looking at my watch and thinking to myself, if anybody wants to talk, <laughs> I'm running out of time for you to be able to do so in any sort of a Q&A. So I better stop there but I could surely continue with this fascinating story about some good men who decided to do something. Thank you so much, Dr. Bartra. That was, I think I speak for everyone in the audience when I say we have to, you know, try to hook our jaw back in because I myself have sat here like that for the past, what, hour, just jaw gaping, listening to you which hopefully I didn't do that in your class very often. At least should, I hope you didn't notice. <laughs> it wasn't that often. <laughs> if you folks have questions for Dr. Bartrop, go ahead and place those into the YouTube chat and I will be happy to relay those over to him. First question that I have for you, Dr. Bartrop, what was it that uh, got you into writing this topic? What attracted you to this? What sparked it for you? Oh, wow. I'll try to do that without occupying too much time. Uh, so I don't, I don't get onto a second presentation. Um, 
many, many, many years ago, um, I wrote I wrote a thesis about Sir Neville Henderson, not in relation to Sir Neville Henderson's anti-Semitism, but rather about Sir Neville Henderson uh, as a diplomat in the lead up to the outbreak of World War II. Um, um, the book that came out yesterday, to which I, I started, which, which I referred, uh, chapter one of that I wrote, this is a, an edited volume of 48 uh, chapters from different people, but I decided to write chapter one on the outbreak of the war itself, um, in which I utilized um, Henderson's role as ambassador. He was actually the man who delivered the declaration of war um, on September 3rd, 1939. Um, and the more I wrote about Henderson, the more I realized this is a particularly obnoxious human being um, that I could never possibly defend. His biographer has done that to, to some extent. Um, but I, I, I wanted to learn more. So I learned more and found that uh, there had been a bit of work done here and a bit of work done there. And I tried to pull all the threads together about um, the embassy and about his staff generally. So that's, that's where I, I came to from that. <laughs> I've, I've written a few pages of notes here. I won't say how many, <laughs> but for me, you know, with Holocaust history, this, this changes a lot. This puts in a whole other scope. Uh, it explains, I think in a good way, because a lot of historians I'm sure have been asking themselves, why didn't Great Britain do more? Why wasn't there more help? And this really helps understand, at least in my view, Henderson being a, a villain of sorts. And the other thing that when you were discussing uh, what he wrote to Halifax, I jotted down, what did he gain from Hitler? I just feel like, you know, he had to be on some kind of payroll almost, you know, that Hitler had in his back pocket. You know, somebody was getting, you know, some, some kind of exchange in a dark corner somewhere in a dark alleyway. It just, everything is just so, I mean, I know that anti-Semitism was, was very strong across all of Europe, but this just seems really intense. How do you watch and hear reports of what happened during Kristallnacht and say, well, I think it's probably uh, exaggerated or it's not so bad, or they had it coming. How, how, how do you do that? Not entirely, Sarah, not entirely. Um, Henderson considered that he had been, and this is a term that he used, he had been selected by Providence to safeguard the peace of Europe. And for him, nothing was going to stand in the way of that, um, which dominated his perspective concerning uh, um, appeasing Hitler, uh, bending over backwards every which way he could, even in the final crisis between September 1st and September 3rd, 1939, when war was about to break out, he. I once got into trouble for describing what he did as a procedural atrocity, um, bad language, perhaps, bit, bit hyperbolic. He actually went, he, he, he exceeded, he, he went beyond his um, brief as ambassador and tried to pressure the Polish ambassador in, war, in, 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 in Berlin to speak to Hitler direct to try to stop the war. And already by that stage, the... Poland had been invaded, but Henderson, so how did Henderson finish up? I'll, I'll stop now. How did Henderson finish up? He wrote his uh, report, got published um, as a book um, and called it Failure of a Mission. He saw that this was a mission that he was on, a mission selected by Providence to save the peace and nothing, as we've seen, including the treatment of the Jews was gonna stand in the way of that. So just another man with a savior complex. Yeah, yeah. Selected by Providence. Yeah. yeah. I jotted down too. I mean, he's, he's just as bad as all of Hitler's little cronies of you have some, some power that you can bestow upon me. You can pat me on the head and say, I'm a good little boy. And by God, I'm going to get in line and I'm going to take that as well. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> This very, very enlightening, exciting stuff that you've presented tonight. I'm not, I'm not going to get very much sleep tonight thinking about all of this. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> That's why you should present like I do at first thing in the morning in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> do you have something you'd like to share, Sandy? This is Sandy Towers Ramirez, yeah. one of our co-chairs for the Holocaust Committee. 
I eat you just a bowl too. Um, uh, I, 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 as I, I second uh, the comments of, of uh, Sarah's um, because I have always viewed the English as, uh, sorry to say, um, very unhelpful uh, to the Jews, uh, both before the war, during the war, so on and so forth. And especially, of course, are uh, the vivid image of the uh, ships being sent away from Palestine uh, during the Exodus. Uh, so this, even though, um, as Sarah was saying, I'm inferring that there were other motives uh, behind all of this um, uh, magnanimity uh, than uh, just being a, uh, uh, doing good for good sake. Uh, but still, at least something was done um, because... Um, Again, I, I, in fact, I made a comment to, to Sarah before you came on I, uh, about uh, Lord Chamberlain uh, and uh, his machinations. Uh, so, so this is this definitely puts a slightly different light on uh, the British and how they treated uh, the Jewish people. At least there was some movement to help get them out. All right, I have a question for you, uh, Dr. Balkan, and that is, um, okay, how is, um, okay, what is your Jewish population in uh, Oceania? What, what, how many, how many Jewish people do you have in, in Australia? Because what I always say, I, in fact, I just gave a lecture yesterday because we're on diversity uh, in Cornerstone in our SLS classes. And I always pull up Middle East and talk about the Abrahamic religions and Semitism, blah, blah, blah. And um, yesterday was very interesting because I um, always ask my class, well, how many Christians do you think are in the world? Uh, and usually it's under. Uh, they, they guess significantly under. Same with Islam. But as far as Jewish people in the world, the guess is always significantly higher than the 60 yep. million. I had one student yesterday say, okay, how many Jewish people in the world? A billion. <laughs> uh, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, let's back up. 16, one, six million. So I always, of course, tap that off with, if you hear this propaganda that the Jewish people are going to take over the world, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I agree completely. So, um, Australia, how many, how many uh, Jewish, I know you have some synagogues, uh, uh, but how many Jewish people do you have? You only have, like, uh, 30 million in the country. The Australian overall population is now about 25 million. Oh, okay, 25, okay. Um, I always, I always mix up Canada and Australia as far as okay. The New Zealand population population of New Zealand, the overall population of New Zealand is about five million. Yes, exactly. More people within, than people. Within those contexts, the Australian Jewish population, so far as we can tell, and we don't have a precise figure for Australia, um, because um, the uh, the question on religion in the census is an optional question. Oh, okay. Um, but so far as we can tell, and from what we can tell from um, internal. Um, Jewish uh, demographic surveys and so forth, we've got about 100,000 uh, Jews okay, in Australia. Okay, I can't do that, right? Okay. About 100,000 Jews in Australia. New Zealand has uh, around about 4,000. 50. Um, oh, that's not bad out of, out of uh, 5 million. Okay, all right. Um, literally, as as one of um, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor uh, Suzanne Rutland from Sydney, I'm in Melbourne, she's from Sydney, uh, wrote... Um, in the title of her book, in The History of the Jews in Australia, many years ago, she called it Edge of the Diaspora. And that's how uh, perhaps uh, Australian, uh, Australian, New Zealand Jews can be, um, uh, can be described. Um, uh, although, as, 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 a, as, a, as a refugee once said, talking to another refugee, I'm going to Australia. Oh, the question was Australia, but it's so far. To which the response was far, far from where? And the whole idea there being, of course, that uh, anywhere you hang your hat is home. And that's how exactly. we knew it. 
That's true. So true. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, <laughs> uh, something I wanted to bring up. Okay, it will come back to me. But, um, okay. Um, well, you think right, about now, oh, now, you have not had a lot of anti-Semitism in Australia. Now, New Zealand had that incident with the mosque uh, about a year ago, something of that nature, and just think that our gang immediately pulled assault rifles. Uh, so, uh, now, of course, you congratulations, you finally came out of COVID lockdown. I heard on BBC News. Yay. Um, so, uh, but what what is the view? Because uh, um, I, uh, that's where I was going with this. Uh, from what I ha have researched, Oceania uh, knows very little about the Holocaust. Exactly. From what I gather, a lot of American, American students don't know much about the Holocaust either. But having said that, um, it is an educational thing. It's, it's going to be an educational thing around the world. Uh, I have a book coming out next year. Yes, Sarah, you can add another one. Uh, I have a book coming out next year called The Holocaust and Australia. Um, really? In which I'll be showing, in which I do show, it's in, in production at the moment. Um, I show that the... Uh, um, the Holocaust can be described as an Australian story, just as much as it can be many other places, because there was an Australian dimension through uh, its acceptance or its rejection uh, of uh, Jewish refugees during the war years. Uh, this was an Australian story um, of the aftermath of that, where Australia was taking in refugee, uh, taking in uh, displaced persons from the from the camps. That's an Australian story. There are lots of ways in which uh, Australia can be described as being a a country that was involved in the Holocaust just as much as the United States was or Canada was, or of course the countries of Europe were, but in a different sort of context. It's all a matter of contextualizing. Okay. Um, can you repeat the, the title for your book, Dr. Bartrop, so I can jot that down and be on the lookout for it? Oh, well, I'll give you the full title. The Holocaust and Australia, uh -huh. uh, Refugees, Rejection and Memory. And I noticed for the very first time last week, it doesn't, the book doesn't exist yet, but already it's been uh, being advertised on Bloomsbury. Uh, but, but, sorry, on, uh, on Amazon, it's being published by Bloomsbury. Being Amazon, uh, uh, advertised on Amazon already as though it exists, it doesn't. Um, but as far as Bloomsbury, my publisher in the UK is concerned, it's very much a going concern. Well, that's so it is something you could look out for, but around about um, August or September next year, I suspect. That's wonderful. I look forward to seeing it. Look forward to getting it. Thank you. You know, it's it's comical to me as well when uh, when you mentioned that. Um, oh goodness, I have my finger here. With news of Kristallnacht, Henderson suggested that well, maybe if we just give back the overseas colonies, if we give back the African colonies, maybe everything will stop. It's just so funny to me how right up to Paul von Hindenburg, everybody said just give him a little bit of what he wants and then that'll appease him, that'll stop. If I make you my vice chancellor, if I make you my chancellor, will you help me control the SA? Will you help me do this and do this? I'm gonna give you these terms. Nobody ever stopped to think, gee, this is a man who doesn't live by anybody else's terms. This is a man who you sign something such as a pact of a non-aggression pact and he literally laughs as he watches you walk down the steps, all happy with it in your hand, like a little boy walking home and showing mom that he got all A's on his report card. That's you know, there are two things there, Sarah. Uh, firstly, there's no doubt that um, Hitler's guarantees guaranteed nothing um, in the long term, even in the short term. Um, it used to be said that uh, whereas other uh, other politicians um, go to the country for the weekend, he would spend the weekend to take a country. Um, <laughs> the other thing was that um, the, the, the whole notion of giving him what he wanted just fed his appetite. Yeah. <laughs> It's um, that bully mentality. It's the bully mentality. You don't give the bully your lunch. You don't give him your lunch money. 
it just keeps adding from there. It keeps snowballing from there. I, I think, uh, if I may, I, I'm not, uh, I love history, but I, that's not my area of expertise. But I think that the world had not truly encountered anyone like this since Genghis Khan. Uh, uh, whereby oh, I don't add. Uh, just, just back. Un unquestionably, they were yeah. up against something, somebody that they'd never encountered before. I'm talking here about the professional diplomats. Um, this is what makes, um, <laughs> this is what places Henderson and um, Ogilvy Forbes in, in, in such, such um, uh, relief against each other. Yeah. Because one, from the, simply from the perspective of just what, how, do you, how do you behave like a decent guy? The other, no, we're going to uh, uh, adopt the models of standard diplomacy to deal with this issue as though we're dealing with what had always been normality. Exactly. And that just didn't work with this guy was concerned. No. Um, there's so much more I could say about this, but I, I'll get on to a rant if I do that, and I don't want to do that. I, I, I won't go into details, um, but uh, we are encountering uh, a similar personality in our country um, of giving, 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 and it will be never enough. Well, it's not only, not only where that's concerned. I'll refer you all to a book um, that came out uh, last year, 2020, Gee, it's amazing to think last year, we're still talking about 2020 and it's just last year. Um, if you haven't seen it around, I think it's probably in paperback by now already. It's a book simply called Strong Men. Mm -hmm. And um, Strong Men looks at a variety specifically of men um, who are these types of leaders from Mussolini to the present. And um, the author does include people who are or a certain person who's, uh, who's much closer to um, um, recent memory. Um, and I won't go into, into any specifics. Um, but talking about several leaders from contemporary times um, uh, in Hungary, in Russia, wherever it might be, in Italy, um, she focuses on, uh, on Berlusconi, who see themselves in this light of um, this, again, this missionary notion that they are there to protect. Look, I've worked in the area of the Holocaust, Sarah, as you know, for many, many years. Um, and I, and you, you, met, you read, read out one of the books that I'd, I'd done about uh, perpetrators of the Holocaust. It's stunning to me to the, this, 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 this revelation that I had several years ago, when I realized these characters thought, they, they, they believed that what they were doing was for goodness. Now, it's probably your definition and, my defin and their definition and my definition of goodness were quite at odds <laughs> where that's concerned, but they had this perspective, what they were doing, they were doing out of love. Uh, if I may, uh, I would rather associate with a divine inspiration, air quote, air quote. Mm. Uh, Some certainly did, sure. Because I'm seeing this, uh, building on, on what you were saying, and you, you as well, Sarah, is that when you have individuals uh, like this, there's an aspect of faith or divinity or suspension of reason. In fact, I was explaining faith yesterday to my uh, to my con law class, my constitutional law class, because we were talking about First Amendment and freedom of religion. And I was explaining what religion was, because my students really didn't understand the concept of suspension of reason. And really, if you look at faith and, re and, and religion and this concept of divinity, which has permeated many leaders and still does. Uh, but, but if you think about uh, your idea I'm doing good, I, is I'm doing something um, 
for the divinity of of my population or so and so forth. So I kind of equate that, especially Hitler, because of the adoption of swastika, uh, even though it was counterclockwise instead of clockwise, uh, the adoption of, of ritual, of the hile, of the uh, of recruitment, so and so forth. Uh, it, it, it smacks of divinity of the concept of I am divine. So as a as a divinity, I am doing what is best for my my flock, for my followers. Uh, there are so many, so many demented leaders for sure. We could go on. This yeah, is exactly. this we could go other 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 hey, all we could have this conversation for yeah. years. Yes, absolutely. So it comes back to the whole savior complex of Henderson that we, we've discussed tonight. And uh, Dr. Bartrop, I think that wraps it up for any questions that I see in the comment box there. If anybody thinks of any comments or questions that they would like me to pass on to Dr. Bartrop, uh, you can see my last name there in the chat box. It is sarah.gotwallace at fsw.edu. If you think of anything, pass that on to me. I will forward it to Dr. Bartrop and I will get right back with your response. Dr. Bartrop, as always, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. Splendid as always, always leave your audience craving more and thinking about <laughs> more, which this is a lot to unpackage. I'm going to be unloading this and unboxing this. You'll probably get an email from me. Hey, what about this and this in a little bit here? I suspect. Yes. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure okay. to hear from you and see you. It's thank wonderful you. to uh, to be back at FSW, even if it's only virtually. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I, I say hello to Melbourne for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to do that. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have an excellent evening.